The following is a special presentation of Fox 13 News. To me, old Florida is old Florida. It's hard to define, but easy to discover. There's no place that even comes close. From the sandy shores of the Gulf to the dusty ranch land. We're trying to preserve part of old Florida for a lot of different reasons. We're in search of old Florida. Educating the public about the foods we had, the way we lived. And telling the stories for people who know it best. So I think Florida has this, the mystery is going to be here for a while. I'm Russell Rhodes. Welcome to Finding Old Florida. We want to share the stories that make our state uniquely Florida. So let's start with a real cattle roundup. And we pose the question to a rancher, cowboy, and conservationist. What is old Florida? I think it's traditions, it's history. Um, all those ancestors that went ahead of us. But to me, old Florida is swamp cabbage. Good dogs, good horses. At the Manatee Sarasota County line near Arcadia, Blackbeard's Ranch, Jim Strickland raises cattle on it. And today, Jim is overseeing the gathering of a young herd. He's using cowboys, cowgirls, and dogs. You'll hear an old adage that said, well, I'd rather have one good dog than three bad cowboys. <laughs> well, that's pretty much the truth, <laughs> is that if you, if you have good dogs, it'll save you a lot of time. <laughs> We want to be able to handle these cows and not have a bunch of cattle stampeding, if you will, into a swamp or into a slough where we can't find them. We never get in a big rush. We try to work our cattle slow. All our cowboys are, are really trained. Jim Strickland's family has been in the cattle business since 1860. Proud of that. The cattle industry has been going on in Florida for 500 years. We're the birthplace of the cattle industry in North America. And Jim Strickland has seen a lot of change, too. Ranch land has become housing developments. Now, he's not anti-growth, but he does hope for balance. So we have to save some of these cattle ranches, timberlands, agricultural areas, for all those benefits that we get from those green space and those areas. But one of the things that keeps it that way is agriculture, the products we grow, but also the benefits to nature, to water quality, to air, oxygen, carbon, recharge. Back to where we started now, looking for old Florida. You can see it here at Blackbeard's Ranch. Jim Strickland is doing his best to hang on to it. I guess what old Florida means to me, history, those that came before us. And we're trying to preserve part of old Florida for a lot of different reasons. There's species that we've lost through what we as human beings have done to Florida. I think that we need to save a lot of animal species, flora and fauna, but we also need to keep old Floridians and keep the old Floridians into the mix and recognize where we came from. And this next story is about a place that epitomizes that old Florida feeling. Now, it was shot in Cedar Key weeks before Hurricane Idalia devastated that community. We still want to celebrate the small town and the people we spoke with before the storm who promised to build back the place they love. And that's the exciting thing is going on across number four bridge and seeing everything that you can see when you cross that bridge. My soul has always been here, but it took a long time for my body to catch up. This is the last best place in Florida. If you want an uh, old Florida experience, you probably have to come to Cedar Key. I think that when people think of old anything, they think of reconnecting. And I think that's why people come here. There is no traffic lights for 30 miles and none in Cedar Key. People want that. They're sick of traffic. They're sick of things and people and stores and shops. And they want to have a more calmer type of activity and a rest. Golf carts. <laughs> Most everybody in this town, you'll have a golf cart. And you basically just jump in the golf cart and go around. I call it old Florida. It won't change. And we're talking nine miles in the Gulf of Mexico that basically we're surrounded by water. It's just going to be the small town that it always is. And what we're trying to do is to define our tourists 
and not let them define us. We don't produce things to draw people here that are activities that are unnatural to our area. We are trying to define what we are and let them enjoy what we are and welcome them to be part of us. Agriculture and the economic impact from that is just as great as tourism. After the net ban in the mid-90s, a lot of our water men and women needed something to do in the water, and they, um, they started raising shellfish, both clams and oysters. The economic impact to this area is anywhere around $50 million a year. Uh, the folks that work in the restaurants, they serve the seafood, so everybody's connected to nature. You can't live on an island and not look at the weather. It amazes me that people don't follow the weather. The clouds today, I'm looking at them right now. I know the tide. You breathe it, you, you can't go anywhere on the road here where you don't notice, oh, it's low tide, it's high tide. We just are always in tune to nature. There's no place that even comes close to the quality of life and um, the, the joy of living in one spot. I think the term Old Florida just helps people that are trying to explain why somebody should come here and use it. Uh, maybe that's with the architecture or the, uh, the way the town's laid out or um, that there's a lot of wooden structures versus concrete. The key to helping folks when they move here, they come visit here, is education. And as an education tool, we try to help them understand that uh, here, native vegetation and certain architectural uh, rules that we have in place are there to help them continue to enjoy Cedar Key uh, so that we continue as they as they come here and help change Cedar Key um, that that change can be beneficial for all of us. And that is really the challenge of the day is how to manage the change in a way that um, preserves everything that we love while you know taking on the reality that tomorrow's going to look different than today. To truly see the beauty of our state, we caught up with famed photographer Clyde Butcher. Over the decades, through his camera lens, he has captured the essence of old Florida. My images give you a feeling of, of old Florida. Even for Clyde Butcher, who's been photographing the state of Florida for four decades, that's a little hard to define. But to me, old Florida is old Florida. But visitors who stroll through his galleries filled with striking black and white landscapes start to get the idea. They said, after seeing your gallery now, I can see Florida better. So it's actually helping people see Florida. Clyde admits Florida's beauty was not so obvious to him either when he moved here from California with his family in 1979. We came here for the sailing. I didn't see anything here to photograph. It, was, it took me four years before I started discovering there was a Florida. He discovered it all those years ago, the same way he still encourages people to do it today, by getting out of their cars. In California, you can see the mountains from your car. You can't see Florida from your car. You gotta get out into it. His passion was born after a short walk in the woods behind an old roadside attraction in 1983. The next day, I came back with my camera and took a picture. I was hooked. I mean, it was just, I've been doing it ever since. Lugging his large format film camera, Clyde's been on thousands of hikes and swamp walks. You really get inspired, you have to get connected with it. His iconic images have turned Clyde Butcher into a household name. There's so many elements involved in this picture that they all had to balance out. One of the reasons I do this is so that maybe we'll keep some of this for future generations so people don't understand how everything is interrelated. And if we don't start recognizing the, the importance of nature, pretty soon we will not have nature anymore. Clyde says old Florida may be shrinking a bit with so many people moving to the Sunshine State, but its remoteness will save old Florida for generations to come. So I think Florida has this, the mystery is gonna be here for a while. Clyde has galleries in Venice and Big Cypress. Now let's explore old Florida through music. You might not realize Florida has quite the history with bluegrass. Enjoy this toe-tapping story with the guys from the Southern Express Bluegrass Band. We call that the gel when you're gelling and then 
it uh, blending together like that. That's indescribable when you're with your friends and that, that comes together and the, and the harmonies come together and the music sounds great. The Southern Express Bluegrass Band is the name of the band and I would describe that as a traditional bluegrass band. mountain music some people call it uh, Appalachian music so it's a uh, has its own style to, in my mind it's, it's the music music of uh, Bill Monroe and Flatt and Scruggs and it goes back for years bluegrass music has a lot of roots here uh, even back in the 70s and 80s, there was uh, a lot of bluegrass music. The Bluegrass Parlor in Tampa, um, Allen's Historical Cafe, which was in Auburndale, for years had bluegrass music on Thursday nights. As a mother, woman's to a mother. We have some great bands. We have a lot of musicians that have come from Florida and are professional musicians that play in Nashville. And uh, there's a lot of music comes from this area. I get a lot of pleasure out of playing music, especially with this band. Uh, these guys are all superior musicians. I'm hanging with my buddies. We're playing the music that I grew up on, the music that I enjoy playing, the music that I'll play for a long time. A lot of our fans grow up on this music, and they come up after the show and say, you know what, that took me back. I remember my dad singing that to me, or my grandfather playing the guitar, or playing the, viol uh, playing the fiddle, uh, and, and, and it, really it really brought me back to that. You can light up the dark. Uh, I think they have uh, a, really just a love of Americana uh, folk uh, acoustic music. And it's all, uh, all like a family almost. If they've never been to a bluegrass show and they come see us, they're going to come back. They're going to be fans afterwards. You can get a feel for what life was like generations ago at a place called Cracker Country. And you don't have to go very far to get there. In Cracker Country, which is a living history museum here on the grounds of the Florida State Fairgrounds. It represents uh, life as it might have been in a rural community in Florida around the turn of the 20th century. Right behind me here is the Carlton House. That's kind of our centerpiece home. And that is where Governor Doyle Carlton, who was Florida's governor during the Great Depression, was born in 1885 in Wachula, Florida. The train station is from Okahumpka, Florida. Most of us know that today as a stop on the turnpike, but Okahumpka was a very important transportation hub long before we had highways here. It started out as a steamship port, and then later, of course, as a stop on Henry Plant's railroad line. Uh, that particular depot was built in 1898, and it's uh, definitely one of the most dramatic buildings at Cracker Country. A couple of other things that are really interesting. One is the one-room schoolhouse from the Castalia community, which is also down uh, around where the Carlton House came from. Um, and also we have a building that we're interpreting as a church here that started out as an African-American schoolhouse. You know, you won't go to anywhere else and find a cracker country uh, that, that goes back and practices the authentic way of living. Just things that you won't see in the city, I get to see every day. And uh, it's a way of life. It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't trade. Oh, how about a taste of old Florida? Some of you may remember this southern snack as a kid. A lot of folks stopped alongside the road to buy them. These days, they're mass produced, but they're still tasty. We visited a family business that has perfected the fine art of the boiled peanut. That's the best way to do it. Put the shell in your mouth crack it open and get everything that's inside that shell out. All of it. All, every bit of it. The name of the business is Hawks Nuts Incorporated and simply put, we mass produce boiled peanuts. 
Family business, uh, parents started it in 95 uh, in a small little warehouse. We grew and grew and grew and had to have, you know, more space each time. It's not just some, some guy sitting on the side of the road. It is a 24 hour process, six days a week, every, every week. Each day we probably produce somewhere in about 2,000 bags a day. Once we receive them, they go through a soaking process in water just to kind of clean them and soften the shell. And after that, they go into the cookers, in which time, you know, they boil, we add the spices, they get the flavor that, you know, people have known for all these years. Once they get done cooking, they'll dump them, let them cool, and then we start the bagging process. The best way you can put it is it's the caviar of the South. Should be a little firm, but soft. You know, it's soft, but, but not mushy. You know, you drive down the road, you see roadside stands, or you go to the fair, and uh, you know, it's just, it's a snack that's easy, fast, and you know, is, is filling. In a world where everything is you know, what's, what's new, what's now. Uh, I, I think boiled peanuts are a, a welcomed visitor from the past for most people. We'll remind them of being at their grandparents' house when they were kids. Every job has its ups and downs, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, and it's kept me from ever having to have a real job, so. We try and make sure that this is the best boiled peanut you're gonna taste. My parents went through a lot of hard work and a lot of sleepless nights. You know, if nothing else as a child, it taught me to get up and, and go to work and make what you're doing the best possible way that you can. We've put out the best we could for 27 years and I hope 27 years from now, I'm having this same conversation with somebody else. You can pick up a bag of Hawks Nuts Monday through Thursday from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. They're on Hale Avenue in Tampa. There's a place in Hernando County where you can travel back in time. It captures the state's past from the prehistoric to the pioneer settlers. Laura Moody takes us there. It's an hour drive from Tampa. But a visit to a historic property in Brooksville will transport you back thousands of years. This is Chinsigat Hill, a manor house, dates from the 1840s on the National Register. We had a total of four different owners on, on the property. We've done archaeological digs on this property and we found projectile points and other things from ancient civilizations. The Chinsigat Hill site sits atop one of the highest points in Florida. The first landowner here was Bird Pearson, the first U.S. Um, landowner, and he gets a land grant through the Armed Occupation Act, and he builds the first structure here. Bird Pearson had over 20 enslaved people on this property working at this time, and the majority of them were children. And so for us, we wanted to make sure we just didn't tell the story of Bird Pearson and other people that owned the hill, but also people that lived on the property. One of those people was Elizabeth Carr Washington. And her history is really interesting because her experiences on the Hill span all the way from the era of enslavement in the 1850s all the way to the mid 20th century. And she becomes a local landowner. The name Chinsigat was actually inspired in a much colder climate. It's an Inuit word which stands for where lost things are found. And how he got that name is that one of its owners, Raymond Robbins, went out to Alaska in the late 1800s during the gold rush. And afterwards, he was looking for a place of peace where he could relax and all these types of things. And he decided to acquire this property with his sister Elizabeth, and they named it Chinsigat, a place where lost things are found. Elizabeth Robbins was a successful actress, author, and suffragette. Some of their visitors to the home were legendary. And then they had all these wonderful people come here. They were progressive-minded folks, so they did some experimental plantings and uh, agriculture here. And uh, Helen Keller visited J.C. Penney, uh, Thomas Edison. At Chinsigat Hill, you can get lost in the past and find a timeline of Florida's progress. When you come to Chinsiga, you're not just learning about a big old house on a hill. You're learning about a Florida landscape that's had many different types of people that have lived on it. 
So a very a landscape that has this very diverse ecological and human history. The Tampa Bay History Center has partnered with Hernando County to offer weekend tours of the home from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tickets are $5. We hope you've enjoyed watching stories of finding old Florida. Have a great day.